This message is a presentation of Pinnacle Baptist Church and the preaching ministry of Pastor Ray McBerry. Other messages like this are available online at PinnacleBaptist.com. The church is located at 2517 High Falls Road in Griffin, Georgia. If you're in the area, we would love for you to visit us this Sunday. Now, here's today's message. I want to do something I don't always do, especially on Sunday mornings, but I want to ask this morning, before I start with the message that the Lord has given me today, by asking, is there anyone that has a short testimony uh, that you'd like to share with the rest of us this morning? If God's done something in your life and you just have to say a word or two, I'm not asking you to preach, but if you want to take a minute or two and share a brief word of testimony, uh, something God's done in your life recently. Anybody at all before the preacher starts this morning? No testimonies. Going once. Going twice. All right, well that just means you want to listen to the preacher preach more, right? All right, well, hopefully that's the case. Would you take your Bibles and turn with me this morning to 1 Corinthians chapter number 9. 1 Corinthians chapter number 9. So the book of 1 Corinthians, of course, is in the New Testament. It is one of many of the books of the New Testament that were written by the same individual. The Apostle Paul is the one who wrote the book of 1 Corinthians, by the way, 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians were both written as letters to the church at Corinth. So this book of the Bible, just like many of the books of the Bible that are written by the Apostle Paul, was originally written as a letter. So as you read uh, the book of 1 Corinthians, it, it would be good to think of it as his letter to the church because that's... That's what it was in actuality. He's writing to the church in Corinth, though, and in the book of 1 Corinthians, this first letter he wrote to the church, he's writing to a church that he himself had helped to establish. It was on one of Paul's missionary journeys that this church was founded. And so he knows the people there, at least the ones that were there when he started the church, and he left them there with a pastor and and uh, continued on his missionary journey, starting other churches. But he's writing to a church that is important to him personally because he had invested so much of himself in this church, in its founding, its setting it up. In the early members of the church, undoubtedly a number of them would have been people that Paul personally led to Christ. So he has a vested interest in their success in their Christian life. So he's writing the book of 1 Corinthians. There are parts of the book where he praises them for things they're doing that are right. There are also parts of the book of 1 Corinthians where, quite honestly, he has to get on to them because there are some things that are not right in the church at Corinth. Now, I want to give you a little bit of background. I won't give you a lot of background because uh, starting uh, very soon, we're going to be studying the book of 1 Corinthians on Sunday night. And so hopefully this morning will whet your appetite for studying this book a little bit in depth. But the church of Corinth was located in a city in Greece. You have the upper part of Greece... Then you have the narrow little strip of land, and you have the southern part of Greece. Now, on the northern part of Greece, you have the city of Athens, which is the most famous of all the Greek cities. Then you have that narrow strip of land, an isthmus, and the southern part of Greece down below is where the Greek city of Sparta was located. Now, if you remember anything about world history from 10th grade or college, you'll probably remember that Athens and Sparta were always at odds with one another throughout ancient history. They fought a number of wars against each other, and they usually ended up getting all the other Greek city-states involved on one side or the other, fighting in these wars between Athens and Sparta, the Peloponnesian Wars. But on that little strip of land that connected the two, the isthmus there, was where the city of Corinth was located. 
So Corinth was kind of the crossroads. It was the gateway from the northern part of Greece to the southern part. And because it was located right there where it was, anywhere in Greece you wanted to go, pretty much you had to go through the city of Corinth. Now I know we've all heard that old saying, all roads lead to Rome, because later on in history Rome becomes the center of the ancient world. But at this time, before Rome became prominent, the city of Corinth really was the center of the ancient world. And all kinds of trading was done there. There were people from literally all over the Mediterranean world that would come to Greece, and they almost all invariably went through Corinth no matter where they were going. So it was a busy place, a bustling place, full of commerce, full of money. It was also, though, a place that was very much known in Paul's day and time for its wickedness, sinfulness. Now, you can think about places you know that are very wealthy cities, and quite honestly, even today in the 21st century, cities that are known for being very wealthy, having a lot of money, there's a lot of wickedness that goes on in those kind of cities today. Uh, I think about, uh, yes, even, even today, I think about the city of Las Vegas. With all the gambling that goes on out there and all the, uh, the stuff that goes on behind the scenes that you don't know about, um, there's a lot of money in the city of Las Vegas, Nevada. But it's also known as Sin City. Well, Corinth was very much the same in the ancient world. A very wealthy, well-to-do city, but it was a very wicked, corrupt city as well, morally speaking. The city of Corinth is where the church of Corinth was located. So here is a church that's been started by the Apostle Paul that's located in one of the most wealthy but most corrupt cities of the ancient world. It'd be like starting a Baptist church in Las Vegas, Nevada. Not exactly a friendly climate for a church to start, especially in the ancient world, really not even still today. So that's the backdrop. That's the background of where this city is, where the church is that Paul's writing to. So now, would you please stand with me, if you're able to, out of respect for God's Word as I read our text this morning. It's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, beginning in verse 24. And here's what the Apostle Paul says, writing under inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He says, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize? So run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others... I myself should be a castaway. Now friends, in these verses, Paul is talking about the Christian life. And he says that in the Christian life, we ought to be running as in a race for a prize. I want to bring you a message this morning entitled, Fit to be Champions. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray this morning, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would Help us to understand your word exactly the way that it's intended. Help us to interpret scripture line upon line, always interpreting scripture with other scripture. Lord, that it would make sense to us, but it would be what you intend, not anything that we've made up for ourselves. Help us to be honest with ourselves, each of us this morning. And Lord, help us to want to be what you want us to be. All these things we ask in Jesus' name and for His sake, Amen. And you may be seated. I can remember when I was growing up. Now, the preacher grew up in the 70s and the 80s. That's when I was a kid growing up. And there was a series of movies that came out that were, I guess for every boy, it was one of our favorite 
uh, movies that we waited on the next one to come out when it was coming out. I'm not talking about Star Wars, but we waited for those impatiently too. But I'm talking this morning about Rocky. Rocky Balboa, the heavyweight champion of the world. It was about an underdog, actually a, a left-hander, who worked his way up, got a big, a big shot at the title fight, and he ended up eventually winning the championship. And, of course, you know the story of the Rocky movies from there. But as a boy growing up, Rocky Balboa, he was kind of, he was one of our heroes on television. John Wayne was the World War II hero we all wanted to be like. The Lone Ranger was the one in the Westerns we all wanted to be like. But it was Rocky Balboa in the ring that we all wanted to be like. Seeing Sylvester Stallone portray Rocky Balboa there in the ring and fighting the fights. I remember Rocky IV came out when I was in high school, when I was a teenager, and it was, uh, it was a match between Rocky and the big Russian fighter. Now, Rocky was, of course, he wore the red, white, and blue when they fought each other, and he was representing America. He was America's hero in the movie. And on the other side was the big Russian fighter. Now, I want you to rem remember, in the early 80s, the Berlin Wall had not come down. The uh, Soviet Union had not collapsed. And so it was still the two superpowers in the world were the United States and Russia. And they were our nemesis in everything around the world. So growing up, seeing this on the big screen with Rocky doing battle against the big Russian fighter, it was, it was kind of exactly what was going on in the world at the time. The big Russian fighter, though, he was a whole lot taller than Rocky. He had the flat top cut. He had the mean look on his face. And he looked just like he was uh, chiseled out of stone. In fact, I remember in the movie, Rocky makes a comment, he's not a man, he's a machine. He doesn't bleed. He's, he's not even a man. Because he was so well trained, so well shaped and defined from all of his training for the boxing matches. But watching that growing up, Rocky was the, he, he looked like a fighter. Sylvester Stallone, who played the part, he made sure he followed a very strict regimen on what he ate, how he worked out, just in preparing to be in the movie. He never fought a real fight his entire life that I know of, but he looked like a fighter. He trained for the part. He supposedly, his character was modeled somewhat, and the name was modeled somewhat on a, a, a real-life boxer, Rocky Marciano. I was, that was before my time, so uh, Brother John, maybe afterwards you could tell us more about uh, Rocky Marciano. Uh, but Rocky Marciano was the only heavyweight champion in all of boxing history to go undefeated. He was 49-0 and 0 when he retired, 49 and zero. In the 49 fights, I believe I read he knocked out 46 of his opponents. He won by a knockout. Now, it's, you know, it's not unusual for uh, boxers to knock somebody out occasionally in a match, uh, in a bout, but it's unusual for 46 out of 49 fights for the other guy to go down on the mat with a knockout. He has the highest percentage of knockouts of any heavyweight champion uh, who's ever boxed. And there are a number of other things about Rocky Marciano that uh, were amazing things, and I'm sure somewhat played a part in creating the role of Rocky Balboa for the movie Rocky. In fact, I remember reading that in uh, 1965 in Boxing Illustrated, they somehow measured the, the force of Rocky Marciano's knockout punch I don't know, they had some kind of a machine that registered the force. And the force was a greater force than a, uh, uh, I'm going to forget the term, uh, a bullet that was an armor-piercing bullet. That's the force he was hitting people with in the ring. That's why he was knocking people out left and right. They said that the, the force of his knockout punch was equivalent to picking a thousand pounds up a foot off the, off the ground from a dead lift. That's a lot of force 
moving a thousand pounds a foot with your muscles like that. You can imagine being on the other end of one of those knockout punches. But when you think of a fighter like that, whether it's the real fighter, Rocky Marciano, or whoever your favorite one is, or whether it's that movie with uh, Sylvester Stallone portraying Rocky Balboa, when you think of a fighter, you think of someone who is fit, someone who is ready to get in the ring and go to it, someone who's ready to fight. You're not going to picture someone who's been laying on the couch eating Cheetos. Uh, they get out and maybe walk to the mailbox. That's about the extent of their exercise. No, you think of a fighter as somebody who's in shape. Some of you are looking around at each other, okay? Don't, I, I'm not trying to do that this morning. But, uh, but when you think of a fighter, you think of somebody that's toned, somebody that's trained, somebody that's in shape. Why? Because they've got a goal in mind. And that goal is to be the best at whatever their sport is. Whether it's softball, boxing, or something else. As a Christian, Paul is comparing the Christian life to an athlete. Now, he's writing to the church in Corinth that's right in the middle of ancient Greece. You all know what else took place in ancient Greece. It was the Olympic Games. The Olympics started in ancient Greece. They were named, of course, after Mount Olympus, near where the original games were held in ancient history. And everyone in Greece that Paul is writing to, they're all familiar with athletes and the Olympic games. And Paul is comparing the Christian life to, to being an athlete. He said in verse 24, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. He said, when there's a race that takes place, there are a bunch of runners. And they've all trained, they've all exercised, they're all there down on the starting line. They're all planning to win. That's why they're there. But only one is going to win. Abigail played in that tournament yesterday. I don't know how many teams there were, but I'm sure there were a number of teams, and I'm sure all of them hoped at the end of the day when they were tired and sweaty and dirty and worn out, they all hoped they were going home with one of those big rings. But only one team walked away the champions. Paul says, we in our Christian lives ought to be running this race like we're running it to win. We ought to be running as though we want to be the winner. Not a winner, but the winner. You know, nowadays in this politically correct climate in which we find ourselves, they've even stopped giving away first and second and third place prizes at field day at some of the schools across the country when they have field day at the end of the year. Why? Because they don't want any child to feel boo-hoo left out because they didn't win first place. Because they didn't get the blue ribbon. There are some schools, I've heard about it on the news, you probably have too or you've seen it online. Some schools have started giving all the children blue blue ribbons at field day. Now what, what is that teaching someone if you just get a blue ribbon for showing up? Not to try your hardest, that's right. That's not what Paul's talking about. He's not talking about just showing up for the Christian life and getting a participation award. Paul says we ought to be running the race like we want to win the race, like we want to be the best at what we do. And can I tell you, this preacher, growing up my whole entire life, was competitive at everything I ever did. I'm still competitive. If you and I play a game of Yahtzee, I'm going to do my best to win the game. My legs don't work as well as they used to, Brother Alex, but if we go out there and have uh, races outside, next time we have a, a church uh, field day of some sort, hey, I'm going, to, I'm going to run my fastest to beat you. That's the way we all ought to be about, well, probably everything in life. If you're going to do something, you ought to do your best at it. But especially when it comes to our Christian walk, 
We're not supposed to just be walking through life, meandering around with our hands in our pockets and whistling and looking up in the stands. What athlete ever won the 100-yard dash by just walking up casually or as they're running down the, uh, down the track, they're looking up in the stands waving to their fans that adore them so much? They're not going to win the race doing all of that nonsense, all of that foolishness. No, the runner who's going to win the 100-yard dash, he's down there, he's on the line at the starting blocks, and, and he's focused. He's got everything else blocked out. He is focused on nothing but getting across that line before anybody else. Now, in the Christian life, it's not a matter of how soon we cross the line. That's up to God. But the question is how well we run the race. We can run it like that person who's just kind of jogging along, smile on their face, taking their time and having a good time, or we can be dedicated to what we're supposed to be doing, running a race to please God. You say, preacher, does that mean you can't have any fun as a Christian? That doesn't mean that at all. We can have fun fun doing all kinds of things in life. God wants us to enjoy life. God wants you to enjoy life whatever age you are. He wants you to be enjoying the world around you that God gave you. But that doesn't mean we have to get sidetracked from the main thing. The main thing ought to be pleasing God. Living for Him. Wanting Him at the end of our life to say the same thing we read in the Bible, well done, thou good and faithful servant. That's what we ought to want to hear from God one day. Again, we don't know how long it's going to be. That's up to God. But whenever it is, we ought to be running our race so that when we get to that point, which we don't know when it's going to be, we hear those words from God. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. But I see here in the text we read, there's only one that gets the prize. So we ought to be running as though we want to win the race. We're not just running it for amusement. I also notice there, by the way, you have to run to win. You have to actually be trying to win a race. Now, if you've put your faith in Christ, you're saved, you're on your way to heaven. It's not your works that save you. It's not being a good person that saves you but we still ought to want to be pleasing to God. 2 Corinthians 5, 9 says, Wherefore we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of Him. That word accepted, you've heard me say it before, it means well-pleasing. We ought to want to be pleasing to God. That ought to be our desire. I notice too in verse 25, He said, Every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things, now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. You know, all those Olympic athletes get those medals when they win. First place gets a gold, second place gets a silver, third place gets the what? The bronze, that's right. Now yesterday, Abigail's team got the first place award. But you know what? Even though those medallions or those rings are made in metal, precious metal, gold, silver, bronze. She's wishing hers was made of gold, especially as big as it is. <laughs> Even those awards we receive in this life are made of metal, something that's durable, something that's going to last, something you can pass from one generation to the next eventually they're all going to corrupt as well. They'll fade, they'll tarnish, or they'll rust away depending on what they're made of. Even the championship rings at some point, they won't look as shiny and nice as they do now. But the things we lay up for ourselves in heaven, those things don't tarnish. Paul says we're striving not for a corruptible reward, but for an incorruptible. You see, the awards that you get from God in heaven at the judgment seat of Christ, if you're saved, those things are not going to pass away. They're not going to be temporary. They'll be eternal. 
they won't tarnish, they won't stain, they won't rust, they won't fall apart. They're going to last eternity. In verse 26, Paul said to run with purpose. Look what he said. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly. In other words, I'm not just running casually, I'm running with a purpose. Dear friends, are you running your Christian life with a purpose, a goal in mind? I'm afraid there are too many Christians that are just kind of, well, I got saved, so I guess that's all there is to it. I'll just go on with life now. And there's no thought about trying to live for God, trying to intentionally please God. If it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, well, I'm sorry, I'll try better tomorrow. But there's no focus, there's no intent on trying to live for God. Friends, can I tell you, if you're not trying to live for God, you're not going to live for God. There are too many distractions, too many temptations, too many things to get you off track. If you're not focused, if you're not intentionally trying to live for God, you're going to find yourself 10 years down the road not living for God. You have to do it with purpose. Like the runner runs with a purpose. You've got to have a single focus. He also said, not as one that beateth the air. In other words, not shadow boxing. He's not just up here uh, boxing, pretend fighting, playing like he's fighting. No, he said, we're supposed to actually be doing the real thing. Not just playing around, but doing the real thing. Fighting the fight, running the race. And then finally in verse 27, it brings us to the point that I really want to bring out this morning. Verse 27 said, But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection. Paul says that if you want to be the kind of athlete that's going to be a champion, or the kind of Christian that's going to be pleasing to God, you've got to have discipline. You've got to have control. That is, self-control. Paul says, I work to bring my body, my own body, under control. For most of us, that's not an easy thing to bring ourselves under control. I skipped over part of verse 25, so go back and look at One word in verse 25 with me. And every man that striveth for the mastery, that is for the championship, is, what's the word? Temperate in all things. What does the word temperate mean? It's a word we don't use very often. The word temperate means controlled, disciplined, not out of control. You've seen someone at Golden Corral who was out of control. You've seen the drunkard coming out of the bar, who was out of control. You've seen one addict of this or that sort that was out of control. But the Bible says here that in our Christian lives, if we want to please God, we need to be temperate. That is, we're going to have to learn to be disciplined and have some self-control. Folks, we live in a world today that is anything but the epitome of self-control. The society around us is falling apart and everybody doing whatever they want to do. Maybe it's been that way to some degree all along. But is there any secret that the last two years in America, somebody dumped everything out on the floor? It's all a mess. People are doing whatever they want to do. The book of Judges says that in ancient Israel, before they had a king, it says that every man did that which was right in his own eyes. In other words, everybody did whatever they wanted to do. That's the same way it is in America today. And not just among unsaved people. That's the way Christians are living today. We're allowing the world around us with this crazy nonsensical philosophy to affect our own thinking, our own values, the way we live as Christians. And it ought not be so. The world's philosophy 
can be found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, just a few pages over. Paul said in verse number 32, If after the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantageth it me if the dead rise not? Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Paul says, this is the philosophy of the world. Eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. In other words, death is coming, so while we're here, let's just do whatever we want to do. Let's just have a good time. Jesus said in Luke chapter 12, verse 19, He said the same thing of the world's philosophy. Eat, drink, and be merry. Not Mary, M-A-R-Y, but Mary, M-E-R-R-Y. In other words, let's just all party and have a good time as long as we're here in this world. Folks, there are too many Christians that are living just like the world with the same wrong philosophy that the only purpose in being here is to have a good time. Do whatever my flesh wants me to do. Do whatever I feel inclined to do at any given moment in time. That's the way lives are ruined. It's the way crimes are committed. I can remember when I was in high school, again to use another sports analogy, I, I remember watching the fellow that I have, to, I have to tell you, I'm not a basketball fan. I do like watching high school basketball if I know some of the people playing. I used to like to watch college basketball. I've never enjoyed watching NBA and won't watch it even if you pay me to sit down and watch it. But when I was a teenager, the greatest basketball player who's ever lived was playing college basketball. He played for the University of North Carolina. He wore, I think, number 23. His name was Michael Jordan. You know, I can remember when I was in college... We had a missionary that came to our church from down in Central America. And the, the missionary said, you, he was talking to the kids one day in children's church about what it's like to be a missionary. And he said, you know, there are still people who have never heard about Jesus. Now, you and I, that's hard to understand because we've grown up in the Bible Belt. Right here in Dixie. We've all heard about Jesus our whole lives. But this missionary told the children that day, he said, you wouldn't believe it, there are people where we serve God down in Central America that have never even heard of Jesus going to the cross. He said, but there's not one boy down there in the whole country that hasn't heard of Michael Jordan. Now this is another country. This was, I don't know, Honduras, Nicaragua, somewhere down in Central America There were people who hadn't heard of Jesus, but they'd heard of Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan, uh, he honestly was undoubtedly the greatest basketball player that's ever lived. He was a North Carolina Tar Heel. Uh, He ended up um, graduating in 1984, went on to the NBA. And during his time in the NBA, on five different occasions, in one game, he scored more than 60 points in one game. I'm talking all by himself, that's how many points. Not his team scored 60 points. He scored 60 or more points by himself in a single game. Now, folks, I'll just be honest with you, that's quite an accomplishment. That's not at the junior high level, the high school level, the college level. That's at the professional level. Five times. But because of all of his celebrity status... Of course, he had all kinds of advertising opportunities, people that wanted to pay for him to advertise their product. You already have guessed where I'm going. Nike Shoes signed him on for millions and millions of dollars, and they came out with the Air Jordan Shoes. Those shoes were the most expensive sneakers you could buy. I don't know if they still are. Still are, okay. And they're still making them. When he signed on in 1984, Nike ramped up their advertising campaigns. Of course, Michael Jordan's face was on everything Nike. 
But just a few years later, in 1988, Nike came out with their new campaign slogan. Just do it. it. See, I didn't even have to tell you. You already knew what it was. In fact, that was 1988. That was quite a few years ago. Yesterday, T.R. and I pulled up to a gas station and I saw a fella get out of his uh, car and walk in the convenience store wearing a shirt that said, just do it on the front. That campaign slogan, along with Michael Jordan, was the biggest thing that Nike ever did for itself. Because people still say that. When when they hear that, they immediately think of Nike. When you think of Nike, you immediately think of the slogan, just do it. It's not the only campaign slogan that that has been effective. The the slogan, just do it, it kind of goes along with those verses eat, drink, and be merry, don't you think? In other words, just do whatever you want to do. Whatever makes you happy, just do it. Isn't that what it's implying? I think so. I think that's probably also why it's so catchy to most people because that's what most people want as their philosophy in life. Whatever I want to do, I'm just going to do it. That's what appeals to our human flesh. There have been some other advertising campaigns that are well-known that kind of followed along with that, some before and some after Nike's big Just Do It slogan. Anheuser-Busch, when I was a boy, had the slogan, Go for the Gusto, in their beer commercials. If I got the beer company wrong, tell me afterwards, don't tell me now. Then there was the, the Marlboro Man in all the cigarette commercials with the big cowboy hat, or macho man's man, riding out there uh, out west with the sun setting there, Uh, like he hadn't shaved in about a day and a half, Uh, a real macho-looking guy smoking a cigarette. And, of course, the the thought they were trying to convey is if you smoke Marlboro, you can look and be like him, a man's man. Or with the the Anheuser-Busch slogan, go for the gusto, hey, if you really want to have a good time, you better make sure our beer is part of what you're doing. But just do whatever feels good. Do whatever you want to do. Ads portraying people doing whatever made them feel good. That's pretty effective advertising, by the way. But there are a lot of Christians that are living their lives by the same philosophy. As Christians, that's not supposed to be my philosophy by which I'm living. Many Christians have no temperance. That is no self-control at all. I'm not talking about the lost crowd. I'm talking about saved folks. They go places they shouldn't go. The Bible says in Psalm 37 verse 23, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and he delighteth in, in him. Our steps and the places we go as a Christian ought to be determined by Is that what God wants me to to do? Is that a place God's wanting me to go or okay with me going? Or am I going to drag His name through the muck and mire of the world if I go there? Would I be ashamed or embarrassed if Jesus saw me there? Would I be ashamed or embarrassed if the kids in the church saw me going there? Or mama or daddy or whoever. The places that we go. Some Christians have no self-control. I can go wherever I want to go. I'm saved. I'm not going to lose my salvation. That's true. If you're saved, truly saved, you're going to heaven. Go wherever you want to go. But that's not what God wants us to do. It's not going to make you unsaved. But I can't help but think God's awfully disappointed in a lot of different Christians who go places frequent places that they have no business going. Psalm 101 verse 3 says, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I know the world watches whatever they want to watch. Christians ought not just be watching whatever they feel like watching with this flesh. We need to have Christians who can have the self-control and the discipline to say, no, yes, I can watch it, 
But should I watch it? No. When I was a boy growing up, it was not uncommon to know Christians that had convictions in their lives, in their families, in their homes. And if you went over uh, as a teenager, if I went over to some of my friends' uh, houses, I knew their parents had convictions and standards for their family. There were some things that if it came on TV, the TV was going off. It wasn't, well, this is our favorite show. I guess we're just going to have to get through this. We shouldn't be watching this. No. They had Christians even 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 10 years ago, had standards and convictions that Christians today act like, what is that? Who really believes like that? Boy, that's so old-fashioned, Fred Flintstone didn't live like that. And we act like because other Christians don't have those same convictions anymore, that we don't have to have them anymore either. But friends, whatever was wrong 20 years ago, it's still wrong today. Just because the world has moved a lot further down the road and there's a lot more smut than what that was, that's still wrong too. We're moving with the world instead of staying where we ought to be. As the world gets worse, we're staying away from the world about that far, but we're moving with it. First Corinthians 15 verse 33 verse 33, Paul said, "Be not deceived, evil communications corrupt good." manners. That is, the people I hang around with have a whole lot of influence on who I am and what I become. I know that young people, this is a lot harder than perhaps it is for grown-ups. But I've known more than a few grown-ups that had a problem with this too. That they just couldn't separate themselves from someone that they knew they needed to separate themselves from. And because of continuing to hang around them, just like Lot did in the city of Sodom, the Bible says, just Lot vexed his soul from day to day. In other words, he was a just man, he was a saved man, he loved God, but but because he was around people that didn't love God, it vexed his soul and changed him into a different person. There are a lot of Christians like that today. They love God, they want to please God, but they expose themselves constantly to being around people they have no business hanging around, and before long, they're using the same words, telling the same jokes, going to the same places, and doing the same things. I'm not talking about when you go to work and there's somebody that works beside you and you don't have a choice about it. But we have a choice in the conversations we have, who we choose to eat lunch with, who we choose to go out to eat with or whatever it is we do, we have choices and we have to make the right choices. We have to show some control, some discipline. Proverbs 23, 7 says, As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. As he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Our thought life. That's a problem for a lot of people. There are some Christians that allow themselves to think and dwell on all kinds of immorality and impurity. Sure, the world does that. They're encouraged to do that. Everything they see on television, hear on the radio, see on the billboards going down the road, encourages us to let our minds wander and race ahead in in immorality and impurity. But the Christian is supposed to say, yes, I see that, but no, I'm not going to dwell on that. I'm not going to think on that. We need to show some self-control, some temperance. I think about habits. Proverbs 23, 31 says, Look not on the wine when it is red, when it stirreth itself aright in the cup, when at the last it stingeth like a serpent, and biteth like an adder. 
which is a poisonous snake. It's talking about fermented al alcoholic beverages. You say, well, Jesus turned the water into wine. Yes, but he didn't turn the water into fermented wine. He turned the water into new wine, which is what you and I call Welch's grape juice. New wine and old wine are not the same. They're both wine in the old, uh, in the old days or the New Testament. Jesus was not giving people alcoholic beverages. Not when he's the one that said in the book of Proverbs, don't even look at it when it's fermented. And yet there are Christians who say, well, you know, I can... Everybody has their own habit. This is mine. But a Christian that loves God, why is alcohol so important that we can't say no to it? For a Christian, there ought not be anything that's wrong that we can't say no to. If there is, that's a problem in our lives. By the way, I'm not just talking about alcohol as a bad habit. There are other bad habits too. The truth is, Proverbs 23 verse 19 through 21 talks about the sin of gluttony, eating too much. And if we had a conference here today with a room full of Baptist preachers, I would guarantee you about 75% of the Baptist preachers would be the ones that that verse would apply to as well. Gluttony, eating too much. I haven't seen too many Baptist preachers that look like they'd missed a meal here and there. I have to confess to you, this preacher has a problem with that. I have to work on it too. Back at the first of the year when I had the virus, I lost a few pounds because I was sick for three weeks. But I decided, you know what? I need to lose some weight. I need to stop overeating. Because I had gotten to the point I was just eating for the fun of it. I guess last year with the virus situation the way it was, a lot of us did that. We sat at home and for a period of time we couldn't go anywhere, couldn't do anything. There was nobody to do business with. Everything was closed, so we sat around and we ate too much. But gluttony or alcohol or nicotine or whatever your habit is, we all have things we need to learn to say no to. And if you can't say no to it, perhaps that's an indication it's stronger than you thought it was. Maybe it has a grip on you that you weren't willing to admit. But we need to say no to things that are bad for us. You say, preacher, is food bad for us? No, it's not. But gluttony is. Overeating is. Doesn't matter if you're a preacher or not a preacher. Gluttony is a sin. It's overeating. It's not good for us. It's not healthy. Christians have a bad habit of never saying no to whatever this body wants. Our grandparents didn't seem to have so much problem with it. Our great-grandparents, they didn't seem to have so much problem with it. But Christians today don't say no to ourselves ever. We're just like the world. We let our flesh have whatever it wants, whenever it wants it. And Christians wonder why their prayers don't get answered. Christians wonder why they never see anybody saved when they witness, if they witness. Christians wonder why they're always down. They're always feeling discouraged, down and out. Christians wonder why they always feel miserable, or sick. By the way, I know there are other reasons for illnesses. I'm not saying there aren't. But sometimes we create a problem because of not living right. Christians wonder why they never have what they need financially at the end of the month. I can't tell you over the last 20 years how many times I've helped other folks that needed a little bit of help and was happy to do it. But they said something along the lines of this after I gave them some money to help them. They said, you know, I don't understand why I'm always just a little bit short at the end of the month. And yet if you added up all the money they spent on lottery tickets or alcohol or cigarettes, 
If you added all that up, they would have had the money at the end of the month that they were short. Oh, preacher, would you please hurry up and move on? It's getting uncomfortable. And Christians wonder why they never seem to have the power of God on their lives. Now, I'm closing. I just want you to know, folks, there's something better than living a defeated Christian life where there's always problems. Now, if you live for God, there's always going to be an enemy out there. But a lot of the problems we have, we create for ourselves. God wants you and I to have something better. He wants you and I to live a victorious Christian life. The pinnacle, if you would, of the Christian life. Here's where some of you say, start saying, he's sounding like the curly-headed preacher. No, I'm not talking like the curly-headed preacher. Because the curly-headed preacher on TV won't deal with sin in our lives. He doesn't do that. But you and I should. We should be honest. And we should confront sins if they're there and get them cleaned up. We must break the habit of being a slave to our flesh. We must learn to say no to this flesh. Whether it's eating too much, drinking alcohol, nicotine, immorality, whatever it is our flesh craves, we need to learn to start saying no. A Christian who can't control his body has zero chance of controlling his spirit. You want to see a Christian that's out of control? They probably have some other things that they're out of control in before their spirit is out of control. They do whatever they want to do. They give their bodies whatever they want to give their body, whatever their bodies crave or want. They don't say no. We've not learned to say no to ourselves, to exercise discipline and self-control. If you have trouble saying no to temptations, you can start training today. Training for the mastery. You too can have victory in your Christian life. You too can be fit to be a champion. Would you stand quietly and reverently to your feet with heads bowed and eyes closed, please? No one looking around. Brother Jim, if you and Miss Mary would come and prepare for our invitation. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray, Lord, this morning that you take the message that you've given me. I thank you, Lord, for the things you pointed out in my own life this week and prepared. I pray you'd help me to be more of what you want me to be both as a Christian and as a preacher. But I pray that each of us that is here today would examine our own heart and see if it's not so that there are things in our lives we ought to be saying no to that we're not. Lord, if there is, help us to make the choice this morning to begin saying no. Lord, help us to find a Christian that will pray with us and encourage us when we need it. If we're struggling with something and saying no to the flesh. But I pray that each of us would rededicate, reconsecrate our lives to you this morning. And with heads bowed and eyes closed and no one looking around, I want to ask a couple of questions this morning. If you're here and you'd say, Preacher, I'm saved. I know beyond a shadow of a doubt if I died today, I'd go to heaven. I know for sure I'm saved. Would you raise your hand and put it right back down? Anyone else? If you're here this morning and you'd say, Preacher, I don't know for sure if I'm saved. Or Preacher, I'm not saved. I need to be saved, but I'm not. Would you raise your hand and put it right back down? If you're here this morning, you say, Preacher, I am saved. But I know there's one or more things in my life I need to start saying no to. Would you raise your hand and put it back down?
all over the room, anyone else. In just a moment, dear friend, with heads still bowed and eyes still closed, in just a moment, we're going to begin to sing a hymn of invitation. As we begin to sing, if you're not sure you're saved, would you come take the preacher by the hand and tell me why you're coming? You could get saved today if you want to be. But if you're here this morning and you're already saved, but you raised your hand that there's something that you need to start saying no to in your life, you don't need to tell the preacher what it is. But during invitation this morning, why not come get along with God at the altar, seal that decision with the Lord at an old-fashioned altar. Don't come because the preacher's asking you to. Don't come for anybody else because they're looking. But if you're making a commitment to the Lord to begin to say no in some area of your life, would you come seal that decision this morning at the altar during invitation? Lord, please use this invitation for your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.